In this movie, we'll discuss and demonstrate some of the data obfuscation techniques that have been developed at the Fondazione Bruno Kessler. Security requirements that we want to meet with these data obfuscations are obviously data confidentiality and also code confidentiality. Concretely, we want to prevent data recovery. For example, we want to make sure that attackers cannot rely on simple tools like the Unix strings tool to extract strings from a binary. More in general, we want to complicate the data flow in a program to prevent static analysis and static attacks. So overall, we want to prevent reverse engineering. At the start of the project, we started to re-engineer and re-implement some state-of-the-art techniques. The main reason for doing so was to have a good starting point in the project to develop more advanced techniques and to study the composability and integration of many techniques, including some existing ones. So these existing ones were XOR masking, where a variable V will occur as a variable V XOR P in a program. A second protection is the merging of variables. For example, if you have two half-word variables in the original program, you can encode them in one word in the protected program. Residue number coding, where instead of encoding a variable V directly, you encode its value modulo P and Q, where P and Q are prime numbers. And then the final protection was the conversion of data to procedural code. For example, a string occurring in your code, you're going to replace it with a function invocation and that function reconstructs the string while the program is executed. With these techniques, we can already to some extent cover the security requirements that we need to cover. Now, let's look at a more advanced example, in this case of residue number encoding. Here you see the clear program and you see that the constants 12 and 7 are assigned to two variables. Also in the binary code, these values will occur. In the obfuscated program, the original values do no longer occur, but instead some big numbers occur in the code, and those numbers can be randomized to some extent. So it's hard for the attacker to learn which numbers, which big numbers correspond to 12 or 7 in this case. You see that because of the mathematical properties of residue number coding, the addition and multiplication can still occur as in the original program, albeit on two variables instead of one. And you also see that before exporting the values, they have to be decoded. You see that happening here. For another example of an existing technique that we re-implemented, here we have the conversion of data to a procedure that computes the data. So in the original program, you might have something like this. To remove the string from the program, we will remove the static initialization and we will replace it with a piece of code that basically implements a Mealy machine. And when given the correct input, the Mealy machine will produce a string password. And so in the obfuscated code, instead of a string, there will be a whole procedure that implements this Mealy machine. Now, unfortunately, these protections come with some limitations, so we need to extend them. One of the problems is that the obfuscation parameters are exposed. You can see this in this XOR masking example. Here, an original expression, A plus B, is rewritten into this more complex expression. But in the complex expression, you see all the constants of your masking operation. So it's very easy to reverse engineer this. So in Aspire, the team at Fondazione Bruno Kessler uh, researched two extensions. One is to use dynamic parameters that change from one execution of the program to another. And the other is to use opaque constants that are not visible in the code. If you look at the dynamic parameters, for example, suppose this was the original expression. With the state of the art, if you convert this into an expression like this, it's rather easy still to reverse engineer it. Not only is it easy to reverse engineer this statically, another unfortunate feature is that the value of x will be the same whenever you execute the program. If you execute it multiple times on the same input, the value of x in your program trace or when you query it with a debugger, it will always be the same. That obviously makes it easier to attack a program, for example, with debuggers and to replay the execution multiple times to get a good understanding of the program. To prevent this and to make it harder to learn from multiple traces, we can encode not constants, but form of dynamic parameters. As you see on the right, the constants do no longer occur in the source code then, and they are actually only computed at runtime, and to some extent they are randomized. Yeah? So the parameter values change for every run, and it will become harder for an attacker to compare the values in multiple traces. As for opaque constants, the goal is to replace numeric constants by runtime computations. For example, we want to replace the assignment on the left with some code that is a dynamic computation and that needs to be analyzed to derive the value of x. In this case, the major problem as a defender is to make that code resilient. It should not be easy for an attacker to analyze it and still obtain the numeric constant. 
techniques to do so have been investigated in the past, so there exists some state of the art. But when we studied these techniques, we discovered that they are in fact not very resilient to automated attacks. For example, the freely available CLI tool can be used to attack the approach by Musa et al. In Aspire, we think we've developed a more resilient approach, and in that approach, we leverage the K-Clique problem. So how do we leverage that hard problem? Here you see the generic code structure. We have an opaque condition that will be very hard to analyze. Uh, definitely statically, it should be undoable, or at least in polynomial time, it should be undoable. And then based on this condition, a bit will be set to zero or one. And so we can set bits of a constant based on a very hard to analyze condition. In our case, what is this condition? Well, it checks whether a graph contains a clique of size k. This is an NP-complete problem, and we think this is more interesting for our purpose, because contrary to existing techniques, there exist no tools that can automatically analyze the code to solve this problem. So how does it work? How do we generate an unsatisfiable k-clique problem? Well, we start from a random tree set generator and a set solver, from that, we get an unsatisfiable Trisat formula, and then using CARP's reduction, this is converted into an unsatisfiable k clique problem. For example, if these were the original constants, and we had some exposed parameters for residue number coding, we we'll replace this with obfuscated code, where the constants are computed on the fly, based on an instance of the k clique problem. Now, we've not implemented the dynamic parameters and opaque constants for all protections, but for some of the existing techniques, we did develop prototype support to extend them with the dynamic parameter technique and with the opaque constant extension. So let's look at how this protection is applied to one of our use cases. In this example, we look at the protection that replaces strings or constant data by procedural algorithms. So here in the original program, you see a MAC2 key that we annotated to mark that it should be protected. Now on the right here, you see the protected program. You see the melee automaton being defined. You see the output function and the next function. So this is basically a collection of states and outputs and the transfer functions between states. And you see that there is a function to generate the original array of values. And you see, if you look for this function in the program, that it is effectively invoked. If you look here in the original program, you see that exactly at the location where the statically assigned key was used. Now we use this dynamically generated variant. That's mostly what I wanted to show. The Aspire project has received funding from the European Union 7 Framework Program under grant agreement number 609734.